gone to quite a few of these quite a few of these sessions, but this is actually the first one in this series. Um, as Keith mentioned, um, I am very involved in Wilmington, Delaware overdose awareness and a lot of the different kind of grassroots organizations, which has kept me busy. So I, unfortunately, this is the first time for this series. Um, but, and so I am not a person in long-term recovery. I am what I always say in recovery from uh, my daughter's um, disease of addiction to drugs. Uh, she attended Karen in 2018. Uh, and today, you know, I am not an employee of Karen's. I sit on the Greater Philadelphia uh, Regional Advisory Board, um, just was appointed to the HR committee. And I help with the, the um, certainly co-facilitate with the parent support group um, and, and some other things. And it's, it's this is so, so near and dear to my heart because Karen has been such an integral part of what I think of as my recovery, like I said, for my daughter's recovery. And for that, I'm inter I am eternally grateful. I talk to parents all the time who don't think of themselves as being in recovery when they have a loved one in recovery. And I think, you know, Karen's done so much with all of us to change that narrative. And I think that that, um, you know, that's an important message because, because of, you know, um, what we go through. So, um, excuse my voice. I do have a cold, so hopefully I won't lose it. Um, so if you can't hear me or anything, just raise your hand. Um, so this topic was interesting for me. You know, I think that, um, both of the traits of patience and perseverance, um, I kept thinking of it as, as persistence. I had to go back and look are critical to family members in recovery, but it occurred to me, well, Kind of putting this together that while they go hand in hand i kind of had to reverse the order a little bit to tell my story um because i found that perseverance is something i had to wrap my head around and change my thinking and my personal beliefs as it related to um having you know um working with anyone in recovery um before i could ever practice patience um so i went a little off script for that so but perseverance is a still a challenging topic to me for two reasons. Um, so I had to totally redefine um, what my role was when I faced, you know, my daughter's addiction, my role as a parent. Um, and then I had to figure out how to internalize and make peace with my new reality, which, you know, still requires constant work. Um, the work's not done. So the biggest challenge for me was how to disconnect with love, stay in my lane and embrace, you know, kind of the unfortunate new reality of watching your child struggle uh, with the disease of addiction. Um, and it was foreign to me and it took me a long time to understand and agree and accept the new expectation um, of myself as a parent. So, you know, and I, and I, and when I think about it, you know, I think a lot of my experience goes back to, I mean, I'm, I'm the youngest of seven in a very religious Irish Catholic family, uh, very close knit family. I was raised by a beautiful, loving, strong, um, very religious mother who will always be my biggest hero. Um, but my fund, my fundamental belief in growing up was a family and loved ones were everything and that supporting, loving and being together was the absolute absolute most important thing, no matter what. Um, and then the thought process, you know, I bought that in, you know, when I had my children as a matriarch of the family. Um, and the belief and confidence, the understanding of my role in life um, and my ability to uh, um, embrace those those traits kind of made up my, my whole existence and worked really well for me. Um, it was almost like a no one left behind mentality. Um, and, you know, as we know with addiction, we sometimes have to step back and understand how we disconnect and how we do things differently. Um, I just believed to my core um, that the, the joy and happiness came from the joy and happiness you gave to other people without little thought for internally what joy and happiness, you know, meant. So, I say that to, to say that um, when I say I, I kind of had to change my whole thinking and my whole re how I was wired 
um, to support my daughter in addiction. You know, it also contributed to me having a great success in human resources, allowing me to kind of support and develop and help other people and have a lot of confidence in important business decisions and in my own abilities. Um, and it served me well. So when I faced my daughter's addiction, I was the person in the room asking questions like, you know, boundaries, what, you know, what do you mean boundaries, you know, disconnect with love. Why would you ever disconnect um, from a loved one? So what I think of as kind of when the bottom fell, fell out, fell out, we ended up at Karen. I was a person in the family program who was really struggling with some of the concepts, um, and the notion was so foreign to me until I had to accept that it wasn't right. And this, this, this was not something that I could control. I had to embrace a serenity prayer. Uh, so for anyone who was in the family program in 2018 with me, I, my apologies. I probably had a lot, a lot of conversations, a lot of things to say and took a lot of convincing because I had to feel it in my soul and in my heart that this change had to happen for me. Um, so it took a lot of convincing, heartbreaking conversations um, and even research, you know, to accept my new role. And once I accepted it truly in my heart that I had no control over my daughter's addiction and recovery, I kind of had to start from scratch and add some, some new tools, some tools to a toolkit, which, you know, I was so righteous and believing I had it all together as a parent. So that was, you know, kind of a shock, right? Um, so to me, pers the perseverance and patience doesn't come until you have acceptance. And that was kind of my, my story of acceptance. Um, but that's where perseverance and patience became crucial because once I accepted the, lo the logic and I could understand what the family therapists were saying to me about, you know, a person in addiction having the power in the family and, and how that whole family model worked um, became easier for me to understand why I had to change as well as my daughter. Um, but it was very unnatural for me in a lot of ways um, that to this day, you know, prioritizing self-care and boundaries, you know, I struggle with not feeling like it's that I'm being selfish um, and that is just the wrong thing to do. And, you know, it's, some, it's something that I battle with every day in the work that I do with, with people in recovery. So, so, you know, here, I wanted to share with you tonight, some of the things that I had to learn to do. Um, and as I had to kind of rethink how I interacted with uh, my family um, and other people suffering with the disease of disease to uh with addiction one of one of the big things for me was learning how to lean on others with shared experiences um other parents professionals and my faith you know to fill that empty toolbox that i now had you know i learned to ask the vital questions of other people um you know how did you handle handle it when your loved one was spinning out of control and you know you understood that they were stuck but that their brain was you know um, suffering from this disease, right? Um, and you know, some of the some of the advice that I got from other people, especially just from an experiential standpoint, were things like, um, you know, don't fix it. Encourage your daughter to you know, ask her questions about what she might do, and encourage her to reach out to other other people for help. Again. Not in my nature, right? But I found it to be very helpful for her and, and for I. Um, and, you know, making the boundaries and sticking to them. Um, I would often have to bite my tongue. Um, my instinct was always just to offer her help just because I wanted, I thought I wanted to be nice, you know, and I wanted to help um, even more than making myself happy, you know, because of, of watching, you know, her struggles and whatnot. And honestly, another place that I really took, um, I learned some great tips was from, uh, if anyone's familiar with Anne Lamott, and there's a great YouTube for the 12 tips I learned from life and writing. Anne Lamott um, is in recovery herself. I highly recommend you give this a listen if you haven't. It's a TED Talk. And it helps me focus and kind of even bring some humor when I feel that I'm spinning out of control. Um 
I mean, that talk, here's just a few of the things that she mentioned. Um, you know, you can't fix or say or rescue anyone or get anyone sober, right? Fixing and saving and trying to rescue is futile and radical self-care is, is, you know, is really quantum and, and important. Um, and it radiates out from you like a breath of fresh air. And I learned that in my support with other parents and things, right? As, the, as that light bulb, um, I saw that light bulb um, come on for people. Um, you know, she talks about earth being a forgiveness school, um, and, but you begin by forgiving yourself. And we, you know, we know as loved ones or people suffering with addiction, you know, we carry that guilt, like those suffering uh, with the disease carry the stigma. Um, and that to give yourself grace um, and to ask for help. So a lot of these things, you know, one of my favorite things she says is a good name for God is not me. And again, with the humor, but reminding yourself that you're not powerful um, over this. Um, uh, and then, you know, she talks about if you, you know, anything will work, you know, the old adage of anything will work again if you unplug it for a while. And that think about that as you think about yourself um, and that how serenity and peace are kind of inside jobs, right? But one of the ones that really sticks with me, and I listen to this to this TED talk a lot, obviously, is, you know, you can't run alongside your grown children with sunscreen and chapstick. It, 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 this is a quote. You have to release them. It is disrespectful not to. And if it's someone else's problem, you probably don't have the answer anyway, you know, speaking from a non-professional standpoint. Um, but I, I had to kind of hear that over and over and over again to prevent myself from trying to dive in um, and do what I always would do, which I thought was helpful, but in fact was getting in, in the way of my daughter and her recovery. Um, the next thing I had to examine was my faith. You know, I had to realize that God didn't let me down and that was a big part of my life, but I had turned away in my, you know, um, sadness, um, and all of these changes. And now I find that my man, my mantra are prayers I grew up with, um, specifically for anyone, you know, the Catholic faith to do with the blessed mother. And that helps me center it. So I had to find something that I can say when I feel like I can't feel back in control. And, you know, that's what I turned back to. And that's something that worked. Um, so, so then that brings me to patience because someone once said to me, and I, I don't know where it came from. I've heard it quite often is that uh, patience is hope with the lamp lit, right? So um, where my shifting and thinking around perseverance keeps me grounded in the reality of my new normal without patience, it's easy to lose hope. So it's often hard for me again, to practice that patience because practicing patience just feels like not the right thing to do um when i felt like i was used to having the answer um i often have to remind myself that you know impatience can be can be hurtful right and so it's okay not to say anything it's okay not to have an opinion um and you know the I found a lot, actually, a lot of power in patience that I never knew existed. Um, I continue, you know, to, to search for resources. I use a lot of the Karen family resources and the wonderful professionals at Karen to learn from. Um, but the power of patience for myself and for others um, in, you know, letting people settle in to what they have to do to recover and also from preventing harm you know, I think can't be understated. Um, so, you know, I wanted to kind of end this by saying that, you know, loving and losing someone struggling with the disease of addiction changes you in your heart and soul. There is no doubt that we have all felt this. Um, most importantly, what I've learned is that it doesn't have to break you. And that's a choice that I make one, you know, every day, one day at a time, um, as many, you know, I, I, I listen to the chapel service every week and that's something that comes back often. Um, and I think that that's an important message. 
So I just wanted to end with something um, that I just grabbed, a saying I just grabbed off my wall because I think it has, says a lot to this. And that is by F. Scott Fitzgerald. For what it's worth, it's never too late or in my case, too early to be whoever you want to be. There's no time limit. Start wherever you want. You can change or stay the same. There are no rules to this thing. We can make the best or the worst of it. Um, I hope you make the best of it. I hope you see things that startle you. I hope you feel things you've never felt before. I hope you meet people who have a different point of view. Um, I hope you have a life, live a life you're proud of. And if you're not, I hope you have the courage to start over again. Um, and that speaks to me. Um, and that's my sincere wish for all of you. Uh, so I, you know, it's been a pleasure being here. I, again, I appreciate the opportunity and I'm grateful for every one of you um, who are also on this journey with me. Teresa, I'm going to stop the recording.